Welcome to Film Roundtable, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Maria Prieto, and I'm joined today by the co-founders of Vidiots, an iconic West LA video store that has found a new home in Eagle Rock. Before we jump in on a conversation, though, I'm going to lead us through a moment of silence to honor all 3,373,085 reported worldwide COVID deaths as of today. We're recording this on May 8th, 2020, 2021. Dang. We'd also like to honor all of our Black, Brown, and Asian brothers and sisters, as well as our First Nations brothers and sisters, whose lives have been taken by the hands of police brutality and other senseless acts of violence. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, these moments have you know, served as reflection from the beginning, from our very first roundtable. And I think it just continues to be important for us, especially now that it feels like life's moving at a much faster pace than it was when we first had our com first conversation. So yeah, thank you for holding the space with us. So moving into today, about a month ago, I went on Instagram and suddenly my newsfeed was flooded with news that the arc light was closing and the pandemic had just really taken a toll financially and they just didn't see it possible to open their doors again. So of course, everyone was reposting the story, everyone was sharing their memories. There was a lot of sadness within you know, the little community that I follow. And within all that noise, I saw a glimmer of hope and that glimmer happened to be Vidiots. Um, Vidiots is a video store that I grew up browsing through the aisles and they opened in 1985, but had to close their doors on the West side in 2017. Fortunately, they found a space at the Eagle Theater in Eagle Rock. And it's now gonna serve as this you know, film community space, which of course will include the video store, a 250 seat, state-of-the-art cinema, along with a mini 40 seat micro cinema, a bar and an event space. So it's basically like everything you could want in a community film art forum. Um, so today I've invited Vidya's co-founders, Patty Pollinger and Kathy Tauber to join me and just chat about the history and their, the future of their beloved space. So Patty, hi, I'm so happy I get to talk to you. Hi Maria, happy to be here. And Kathy, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the round table. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the best place to start will obviously be with the Vidiot's origin story. So from what I understand, you two were childhood friends um, with a career in music, Kathy. And Patty, you were already involved in film in a capacity. But Patty, why don't you walk us through those early days before you even opened you know, those conversations that you started having about opening this store. Um, well, Kathy and I were both not happy working for other people. So we knew that and we were looking to be independent and working for ourselves. And um, we had just recently gotten VCRs and were really um, disappointed with the choice out there um, of what we could watch and, um, we um, stumbled upon this article in Esquire magazine talking about these other video stores across the country, one in Berkeley, one in New York. Um, and it sounded so exciting. They had experimental films, they had independent films, which was just becoming a big, huge thing in 1985. And we're like, we're in a film city and we, haven't, we don't have these choices. So that's kind of how the idea got sparked. And Kathy, what was, the mission statement driving videos, you know, what made it stand out from, you know, Blockbuster or Hollywood video? Well, <clears throat> Blockbuster and Hollywood, we, we were before Blockbuster or Hollywood video. Um, I think Blockbuster might have started the same time, same year we did, but they weren't in LA for, mm -hmm. you know, several years later. But um, at the time, there were just all these mom and pop video stores opening in every little strip mall and it was the booming new business so 
we kept telling everybody, no, you know, you'll see we're going to be different. We're going to have all this, you know, independent film and foreign film. And we had, you know, we had fantasies of having a coffee bar and just having a hangout and the community, you know, was community oriented uh, in our minds, uh, having events. We, you know, had events from right when we opened. Mm -hmm. So when we were telling people we were opening a video business, they were like, oh yeah, you know, just what we need, another video. So we were like, no, no, it's gonna be, you know, and even the look of the store, yeah. we, wanted to, we wanted to be really evident that we were different. And so we were on a really limited budget. We opened with 800 videos, VHS, and we had some film friends that were, you know, film students that really helped us handpick every one of those 800 tapes so that they mm. were really, you know, an impressive selection, even though it was small. The look of the store that you mentioned, I mean, it is so iconic, you know, the way it's painted, your logo, everything, but how did you guys find that space and how was it structured? Where would you hold the events? Like, could you just visualize that for us a little? Well, the, our, <laughs> our inventory was so sparse right and they were on these like weird wooden racks that our architect built i we just drew funny shapes and he made them out of wood and later we had rolling racks which made it a lot easier but we would move the racks and we would rent chairs and you know just clear out the space but the space when we opened was like less than a third of the size mm -hmm that it became, it was small, it was a thousand square feet. Mm. But we, you know, we pile people in. And what kind of events were you having in the beginning? Patty? Sorry, Patty. Oh, um, <laughs> everything um, from, I think one of our first events was with Kenneth Anger. We had, um, we would get performance artists from the Venice Boardwalk to come in. <laughs> Um, we did documentary films. We had one of our first events was a documentary, Mondo Elvis, and we had an Elvis impersonator come and it was a real big party. It was really fun. Um, so, um, yeah, we had really unusual stuff. Like we had, um, this group from the Bay Area called Survival Research Labs. Um, that was sort of a performance group that did, uh, robotics that exploded. Um, and actually Mark Pauline, one of the leaders of that group had blown off one of his fingers and was asking if he could blow up things in the store. And we said, no, I think we'd like to refrain from that <laughs> aspect. Um, but anyway, yeah, we had a lot of fun events in the beginning. Well, Patty, did these events kind of serve as almost fundraising for you guys to get more videos? Not at all. They were all free to begin with. <laughs> yeah, um, we were just, like Kathy said, we were really interested in building community and making it a fun space. And, um, you know, we did put all of our profits back into the store to grow the inventory. We did mm -hmm. do that. But um, I think, you know, it helped us get publicity. It helped us grow community. Yeah. No, for sure. Kathy, how did that inventory start growing? You know, from the 800, you know, at what point did you just start amassing more? Where would you go looking for them? Um, would you get feedback from the clients as to what they wanted? Actually, we did. Um, you know, neither Patty and I really had a film background. And it often was customers coming in because we had all this unusual stuff. They would they were educating us in a way at the beginning. And um, we were going, initially we were going like to video artists and we were acquiring, you know, Rachel Rosenthal and, you know, directly through video artists. And we were really searching for foreign films and they would have these warehouses of used VHS and we'd make these trips out to the Valley and, you know, be like, ah, oh, we found picnic at Hanging Rock or, you know, something that was already, even in the early days, they had already like released stuff and then pulled it. And, you know, so we were, we would, we would search and then people pretty quickly, like people would start coming to us with their weird stuff or the foreign mm -hmm. films. And um, 
once the word was out, you know, we'd have independent filmmakers coming and, you know, we'd have a free section of, you know, small independent films. That's amazing. So it got, it got easier, but, right. you know, initially we were really seeking it out. Honestly, have you guys ever pitched this as a TV show? Because like the visuals of you two, like driving to the valley, going, going through all these VHS, like what? It was cryo. It was really, I mean, we would, Patty be one end, I'd be the other end, and we'd, look what I found. <laughs> oh my God. Wow, well, Orpheus, or <laughs> just something really. <sighs> Wow, no, I, I think you guys maybe need to make this happen. <laughs> I mean, I, I know there's a lot on the plate right now, but I don't know, the video, it's origin TV show, I would 100% watch that. Um, Patty, we've known each other for over 15 years, which is crazy for me to say. Wow. It felt, felt like a minute. Um, but I met you, I was in middle school, and I remember when I learned that you owned a video store. I was blown away. I was like, what? And I went to your house because your daughter has become and continues to be one of my best friends. And I just loved that there were videos everywhere. And you know, you would just come home with like more rentals and there was just always stuff to watch. And really, I remember I did get annoyed though because I would ask Emma like, oh, can your mom bring home the Amityville horror? And you would always bring home like the original versions of things that I wanted to watch. And you're always like, no, the original is definitely better. But you know, like 12 year old me, it was like, I want to watch the R-rated remake. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic. I remember hoping that at one point, maybe I could work at videos because I considered myself to be a cinephile. And then as I grew up, I realized, oh no, the people who work at videos are like legit cinephiles. Like they could point you in the perfect direction of what movie to watch. Their, their depth of knowledge was just, it was, Amazing. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that culture you created with your employees and, you know, the way that they really ingrained themselves in this community that you built. Um, I give so, so, so much credit to the success of Idiots to our employees because they were so invested in the store. And um, I mean, we did give them the freedom a lot of the time to go with that. Um, and you know, if we had a gay employee who was really interested in growing, um, you know, our films in that area, we would let them or if, you know, each employee might have their genre that they were um, really good at, at knowing all the, I mean, they were like savants. I mean, really, um, we have one employee who can like recite every Academy Award winner since the Academy Awards began. I mean, like they are still running, um, in combination with movie. I know you know this with our um, movie trivia and really um, just have an amazing film knowledge that, um, but they they would help be so helpful. You know, it's not like, you know, just going to an algorithm. They would go in and, you know, get into these discussions with people and people appreciated that so much. Or just, if you like this director, maybe you should look at this and, um, you know, just that human, human contact and, um, you know, advice was just so valuable. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up, Maria, because they really, you know, and I think it, it kind of happened organically where everybody, like every, they all had like their different, like Patty said, they all had kind of their different expertise, mm -hmm. even though they were super knowledgeable about everything, but the employee, the customers would kind of gravitate to, oh, you know, I, I, Patrick knows what I like, you know, they would come in and they would have their favorite employee that right. they trusted their recommendations and. Oh, I love, yeah, it's like having like your favorite bartender, you know, yeah. just you're like, they're going to know exactly. Yeah. What you need. Exactly. We would on our application, we would say, we would ask your five favorite films mm. and it just, you know, it's just kind of, you would get a, an idea of the person's taste. Something else that I felt was very unique to the store was the layout and, you know, the way that you guys categorized films. So Kathy, could you talk a little bit about the evolution of, you know, how it started with those stacks that were wood and hard to move and then evolved into this very curated um, world? Yeah, well, it started, you know, 
we always had the categories and then you know as we grew i think in a year and a half we were already doing our first expansion i think at that time we were switching to the rolling the rolling racks which you know we went from when we opened trying to make it look full because we had so few things to you know suddenly running out of room we were growing you know really fast the inventory starting from 800 and ending with 50,000 <laughs> you know um but the categories um sometimes i thought they were getting a little too carried away <laughs> Your employees, our employees would be like, oh, we need a section for this and a section, you know, we'd be like, oh yeah, that sounds good. And then I would be myself like, where is that? <laughs> what category? Is the UFO that? section or is that in the, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. They yeah. were very niche, yeah. And then we were doing the directors and we never wanted, you know, customers to feel intimidated by, you know, not knowing a director, you know, it just, we didn't want to have that that vibe so um sometimes we had to pull it back a little bit did you have to have like a team meeting like all right guys this is <laughs> <Sometimes>. a little <laughs> yes we once had a um customer who was an independent director um i mean i felt privileged um they had um their assistant come in with a letter about why they should have their own section um what yeah <laughs> They were insulted. And I would yeah. say that this yeah, like, didn't was really like, have a body of work, but they wanted a section. I mean, I was complimented that they we went were, to such yeah, We started to say, okay, if they don't have at least, you know, so many movies, then it's, yeah. Oh my God, but I love that they sent the assistant. <laughs> <laughs> that says so much. Um, would you say that there was either an employee or a client who saw all 50,000 50, films in your collection? Ooh. No, I don't think so. Yeah, no. I don't think so. No, I think I mean, some of our employees, I mean, I, you know, in the early days, I was kind of insatiable myself. You know, we work these long hours of Patty and I, you know, we're there all the time. And then you'd go home at 11 o'clock and be kind of stimulated. So I, you know, I was just watching movies. I'd go home and watch two movies and I was kind of insatiable myself quite a, mm. you know. Um, the store had its fair share of eclectic clientele and I want to hear some stories about that, but I want to first zoom in on some of the exotic visitors that came from next door. So Patty, I've heard some snippets, but could you just take us through some of the antics that occurred because of your next door neighbors? Yeah, we um, were, our, we shared a wall with a pet store. And, um, you know, at first we had, you know, crickets escaping. We thought, oh, that's weird. And we figured out, you know, that was snake food that was escaping. But then um, we actually had a series of snakes uh, escaped in the store. and um, the, we would give them back to the pet store. But by the third one, I think it was a white python. We just sort of lifted it up into the air and asked if a customer, any customers wanted it for the taking because um, we were getting a little fed up with um, runaway reptiles. Um, but the biggest reptile, um, uh, they were bathing some Australian monitor, which is basically a miniature dinosaur. And all of a sudden it ended up in our aisles of our stacks of our VHS and roaming the aisles. Um, and I think we also had a large iguana, um, if I can remember. Yeah. So it was one of the qualifications. Lots of, lots of mice. Oh. oh, yeah, that they also feed the yeah. snakes. Yeah. 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 Were the qualifications for the job like must know how to deal with reptiles and mice? Uh, it should have been, probably should have been. We had our manager was like a saint. Oh, definitely. Scott. Oh, my God. He deserved the medal. Yeah. For all the reptile rescues. Yeah. When did the pet store, did they eventually leave or were they next door to you guys the whole time? They changed owners, but they, they okay. still there. In fact, they took over. Okay, so they're they the ones. took over the video space, and now they've given yeah, it back. Close. It's release. Mm -hmm. The old video is release again. Well, Kathy, I'm curious if you have any fun little stories like that about just eccentric um, moments in the store. Oh, yeah, there's many. Um, 
Well, we had an event where there was a girl fight, a fist fight. And oh. my mother was wiping up blood from the floor. <laughs> and we had a streaker. We had a guy, you know, at an event just take his clothes all off. We had a streaker. And, you know, <laughs> it's some, we had some pretty wild, wild things. And then we had, you know, just like the local, you know, it used to be the homeless situation wasn't what it is now, but there were, you know, there were our, our local, you know, homeless people that we knew mm -hmm. um, that we had names for and, you know, they'd come in and, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, Patty, are you anything else coming to mind? I'm kind of, I'm kind of blanking now. Um. I just used to be surprised when we, I mean, it was cool because a lot of times when we had our live events, we never recorded them. And I was thinking about that. And I felt like we got a lot of startling, interesting moments in those events because they weren't recorded. They weren't put on Instagram. And um, I think a lot of people said things they never would have said. Um, I don't want to repeat anyway, but it, I thought that was really cool that, you know, we just heard stuff that I don't think would be yeah, you're right it would be a different a whole different thing now because yeah. yeah. it, yeah. it was really intimate and it was really spontaneous mm -hmm. and yeah so that was really cool yeah yeah you're right there's something about now not being sure like anyone could just be recording you so it, and, and then everyone's getting canceled so you just don't know what you can say. you have to be so careful yeah yeah so it was a different time yeah mm -hmm. um Kathy, at what point did you guys start digitalizing some of your films that were even kind of endangered? Um, you know, videos that never came out as DVD or films that were just really hard to find? Really not till towards the end. We had um, some archivists come in and, you know, in 2000, I guess it was maybe it was like in 2000, early 2015, we thought we were closing and then, um, Annapurna, Megan Ellison came in and helped us survive another couple years. Uh, but at that time, you know, we could tell when it was announced we were closing, you know, everybody wanted to come in and pick and choose and pick through the rare stuff. And so it was the VHS that is really in danger of deteriorating because it does have a lifespan. And so we had some archivists come in, they spent you know, weeks and weeks, you know, coming in a couple times a week for a few hours going through the VHS. And then um, they very graciously are, you know, digitizing mm. stuff. So, yeah. The, the you... VHS, there's so much VHS that never even made it to DVD. And right. Really, and, you know, like the stuff we were getting at the beginning from, you know, some independent filmmakers that are not so independent anymore. So it's just, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, to this day, I feel like you guys have a collection that is so rare that, I mean, I, Patty, I feel like you've mentioned this, but people will come to you guys asking for footage, but could yeah. you dive into, you know, the role that you've played and, um, you know, allowing access to this, to this content? Yeah, um, I mean, we have a history of production companies and advertising agencies coming and asking maybe for a theme or a scene or and then we'll have it. But I mean, we have so much interesting rare VHS that doesn't fit into the normal film categories. Also, I mean, we have like a Nam June Pike interview with uh, or a conversation between Allen Ginsberg and the performance artist Alan Capro. We have that kind of stuff. And then we'll have like a Sonic Youth concert from 1983 um, to um, a gay man's guide to, to safe sex from 19, what was that? I don't know, early 1980s. I mean, they were just sort of um, cultural snap, snapshots that you don't see. Um, so yeah, we have, Lots of stuff like that. Is there a way to search through that library online or once you guys reopen, like how can, and how can people have access to it? Like, is that something you'll be able to rent or is that just so rare that it's more, you know, in the vault? 
um, we hope to be able to rent, you know, um, and I um, also hoping to have a software system where you can search. I mean, we always had it internally where we had keywords and things where we could to a point, but really, again, it was our employees, um, you know, library of the mind that found, you know, or remembered, you know, what was there. I mean, we would often we'd have a production company call and ask for like they wanted a specific scene or you know and it would be like being on a game show and the I you know if they could we could find a hundred a hundred you know DVDs they would rent them um, and that was our that was really our bread and butter for mm -hmm. a lot of years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, have you guys collaborated with museums? Because it almost sounds like museums could also put exhibits with this stuff. Well, we did talk when we were thinking about closing in 2015, like AFI or the Academy was interested, but as Kathy said, and only, you know, certain the certain rare titles. And, you know, our hope was that we could keep the collection together. So that was, you know, what yeah. we were hoping for. Would you say you ever felt like there was a peak, you know, kind of like this is the Mecca for cinephiles. We are like the best of the best. Like, was there ever that moment? There was a peak financially. There was a peak in, you know, uh, I think it was 2000, Thirteen, maybe. Mm, really? Earlier than that. I earlier think earlier than that. than that. I think earlier than that. Yeah. Maybe to like late, like two thousand eight or something. Okay. Where we probably peaked out, and then it started declining. Mm. And Patty, did you realize? Like, at what point did you realize things were changing? And is there a specific culprit, or is it kind of like an amalgamation of TiVo and Netflix and? you know, other factors. Yeah, I think it's an amalgamation. And um, I think, you know, obviously we were feeling the strain by 2010 because that's when we decided to build the annex as mm -hmm. an, a way to um, increase our income and just, you know, diversify. And so we were always looking for ways to become to stay relevant and um, you know reinvent ourselves. So at one point, when we first opened our 50 seat annex, we started having film classes, and they were incredible. We had incredible. We had instructors from USC and Santa Monica College, and um, but you know that was difficult. That was difficult. Um, to make money doing that, that was really complicated. And it was like a whole nother business really. Um, I mean, we had some incredible classes. I wish we had recorded those. Um, and then um, we, again, in 2012, um, decided to make the annex as a, as a separate nonprofit. And then 2014, we went all, not, all in for nonprofit, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as things were changing, we were trying to change with that. Yeah, I mean, I remember going to a screening of Sicario and that annex and then Roger Deakins spoke. And yeah, I mean, that space was magical. And, it, you know, it, it did have that intimacy that I feel like maybe your earlier events had, even though at that point, obviously, we could have been recording Roger, but people were very respectful and people were just there to like listen and learn. Um, so I can only imagine that those film courses were Magnificent. Is that something that you guys want to bring into this new space? There's some educational component. Mm -hmm. for, yeah. For all ages to, to you as well, yeah. because I feel like with, you know, the scrolling culture that they're, they're missing so much. Mm -hmm. And this is how young filmmakers, you know, come up is by seeing other work, knowing about other work. And so I think it's really important to expose youth to this. Yeah, we had James Gray on a, on a round table a while back and that's something that he was very adamant about. He's like, 
you know, the way to be good at the work is to look at other work and then be inspired by that work and even steal from that work. And that's just how, it, that's how it goes, you know? Um, I want to shift a little into when you guys had to shut your doors in 2017. I mean, obviously that was a financial reason, but I, I'm, yeah, can you just talk a little bit about that period, Kathy? Sure. So um, it was just, it was just getting harder and harder to keep it going. We were, you know, out of the annex, we were, you know, got, went nonprofit that that helped going nonprofit because we were able to do fundraising and we were doing charity buzz auctions and all that helped, you know, but it was, you know, we were working harder and harder. We were doing all these events. We were, you know, shaving down our staff and, uh, you know, it just was getting really, really difficult to keep it going. So um, we just thought we better do this or we're going to end up in big debt. Yeah. So um, I think uh, we kind of saw it coming and it was hard, you know, it was hard. It was hard to come to that, you know, we had our employees we felt responsible for, we, you know, it, it, it was a tough decision, but it was kind of, we just felt like we, we were so stressed out ourselves, um, trying to, trying to keep it going. Yeah, you guys really exhausted. We did a couple big fundraisers and, you know, that helped, but it was like, okay, that's only going to get us through another couple months. So I think um, we counted like 65 events we did that last year with such a skeletal staff. But also the neighborhood was changing a lot there, I think, from when we first moved there. So that didn't help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our landlord was, you know, threatening to increase our rent by a great deal. Yeah. So all those things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, you guys shut your doors, went into this period of uncertainty almost. At what point did you start thinking about reopening? Was that just kind of like the conversation the whole time? Or did you guys kind of need a period of mourning? Well, we had brought in Maggie McKay, mm -hmm. who is our executive director. She came in um, May, I think, of 2016. So she came in to try to, you know, keep it going. And it was like, uh, I don't think this is going to, you know, poor Maggie did not know what she was. She, she like, fired the, the sinking Titanic. And she was like, yeah, it's coming. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. I mean, we we were really honest with her what was happening, but um, anyway, so it was what it was, and Annapurna was still involved, and they, um, this was kind of their, I mean, we had like, we have to shut down, we can't keep it going, and then um, their idea, or Megan's idea was to kind of, you know, close down and reemerge. That was kind of the the idea was to close that. We were hoping it would be like a year, year and a half. We could reopen somewhere on the east side. You know, to us, we you know we don't we didn't even go to you know that part of town. And they, I mean, they were right. That's where kind of the film industry has moved. Right. Um, and it's not in Santa Monica and Venice anymore. All the you know young independent filmmakers and film lovers seem really, really excited in Eagle Rock. They're very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, this actually brings me to my, my next point. And Patty, you touched on this and how the neighborhood was changing and, you know, it just felt like it was time for a move. And I mean, I think it's really exciting. I'm a little envious because I myself don't go to that side of town that often either. And to now hear about this amazing space opening over there, I think I'm just gonna have to make the trek. <laughs> but Eagle Rock is, you know, it has been an underserved community in terms of film for, you know, for as long as I lived in LA, um, which is my whole life almost. So I think it's so exciting to open this type of space there. And I'm curious, Patty, why don't you start, What kind of impact you hope that this has on the community there? 
Well, there's just a scarcity of screens in general on the Northeast. So um, I just don't think, um, well, first of all, we wanted to have fair and equitable ac access and have it be affordable mm -hmm. for the community. And I think, you know, that in itself will have an impact and just, you know, showing films that like repertory or art films, um, emerging filmmakers, just for the community to have access to that and to education programs. And I think it is gonna have a huge impact on the whole community as hopefully a community film space where, um, you know, Maggie's husband, um, luckily for us, is you know a DJ at KCRW. So hoping to have hybrid events, you know, mm. incorporate other things besides film, which we did in our our own business as well. We had music um, quite often. So um, yeah, I think it's going to have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, converting the theater is a really ambitious undertaking. And I know right now you're still fundraising to you know really start on the construction, but I wanna fast forward a little and let's all just pretend we're already there, it's opened. Um, Kathy, what challenges do you foresee the space having in the first five years or so? Um, well, uh, probably the challenges of any new business, but um, I, like on one hand, I think people are so starved and will be so excited for this. Mm -hmm. And there's also so many people that grew up in that area that remember going to the Eagle Theater. So there's mm -hmm. that, you know, there's those people too that are gonna be excited to have the theater. Um, but it's just gonna be, you know, growing it and getting enough membership and, you know, um, hopefully it will grow fast. Um, but you know, any it, it's I'm sure it's going to be challenging the first few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Patty, what about you? Um, yeah, I would concur. Um, I think um, it will help if we can rent the space out for like you know academy type screenings. If we can rent it out um, because there is a scarcity of screens on the east side, that'll greatly help you know, right. with revenue streams. And, um, but I, I do think, um, and I even heard like, you know, the head of Hulu or I can't remember who it was, somebody say that they um, worry about the future of theaters, but not when it comes to theaters that are differentiating like the Alamo draft houses and things like that. I think that um, the theater experience hasn't evolved that much. And I, I think that we have a chance as a different kind of space to um, be successful. Okay, good. I do want to touch on that in a little, and you know, the future, especially. Right. But I want to talk about the other spectrum. You now, apart from challenges, Kathy, what are some of the exciting things that are going to be happening? Obviously, you know, education, screenings, but if you could just get like specific about what you see. Oh, I just think it's going to be a fun, a fun space and there'll be you know lobbies and commute you know you could where people can hang out after the movie and talk to each other about their movie and you know have a drink and browse through videos and I mean it's going to be so unique and um just I think very exciting I love that you can leave the movie and then go pick another movie for like you know your right. After right. the movie, yeah, yeah. After the right after the, because you know, some often you go to a movie and you think, oh, I want to see that director's exactly. other movie or something else, and you know, right. it'll be right there. Yeah. So, oh, that's yeah. awesome, Patty. Yeah. What about you? And it'll be fun. It's just going to be a fun space. It's you know. Yeah, I mean, I just think back to our first days of opening and how Saturday night was like a party, and you know, hopefully that feeling will be there as well. And, and um, we're, you know, also hoping to have, you know, specialty merchandise stuff, like maybe uh, one of a kind type movie posters and um, I don't know, just fun, mm -hmm. fun, fun cinema related stuff. And, um, but yeah, I think like, um, you know, the Q and A's, the, um, like I said, music events or whatever, I mean, 
we had spoken word events at, at our store. So just, you know, making it a community space where fun things can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for the whole family and for friends and yeah, this is, sounds awesome, guys. Let, let's live there. Let's fast forward. <laughs> um, okay, but now I want to go like back in time, like way back in time um, to the 1918 pandemic, which really caused seismic changes to the film industry. Um, a little history lesson. I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this podcast know about this, but for those that don't, um, a lot of that was due in part for, because of Adolf um, Zucker, who was the head of the studio famous players, which, you know, then became Paramount, but he had this idea to buy up all of the struggling mom and pop theaters um, that, you know, were shut down because of this pandemic. And suddenly he had over 2000 screens and he was also producing the movies and it, it was kind of the birth of vertical integration. And now we have the studio system to this day. And anyways, it has totally shifted the way um, we see films. So I'm curious, I'd love to get both of your takes on how this pandemic could shift the way we see films in the future. Um, Patty, let's start with you. Well, as I was saying, I think that it will hopefully will change um, to be more experiential and, mm -hmm. and, um, and how that exactly unfolds, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, there could be things in technology that advance that I'm not sure what those things will be. Um, but I don't think that, you know, just showing mainstream movies with, you know, a popcorn is going to make it anymore. And, and, you know, I think people will let us know what they're craving for in a way. Um, listen to your audience. And um, I do I mean, we're planning to have a 35 millimeter projection and you want to make, you know, it's special and spectacular in, in some way. Um, and I think there's ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm all for experiential as long as it doesn't involve the 3D again. I was not a fan of the 3D. And there were certain movies that started doing like odor and stuff. Do you guys remember that? Like, oh no. yeah, yeah, scratch and sniff. No, thanks. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Let's yeah. not do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kathy, what about you? Um, I just think the pandemic is going to, you know, I think people just miss community so much that I'm hoping that the appreciation of getting back to, you know, having social community events is I hope people will appreciate it for a long, long time after this. And I think they will. Mm -hmm. You know, I think yeah. it's going I to be, you, yeah, know, I you know, like, I, it's, it's what I miss. So I think. Yeah, I agree that know, human. It will affect us all. Yeah, for a long and time. I love what you said earlier, Kathy, about having a space to then sit down after seeing a movie or after seeing an event at your space and really, you know, connecting with the people you went to see it with, or even meeting strangers and discussing what you just yeah. witnessed. Yeah. And then, Patty, what you just said about, you know, audience is really craving something different. That's not just, you know, another blockbuster film. I think we want to see uh, really unique stories of humanity. And I mean, that's the content that you guys are putting out on the screen, so. Um, I was just gonna say, there's also something I can remember about seeing at the Ace on Mother's Day, Mommy Dearest with 600 other people. And that was such a different experience, the reaction and people like saying lines out loud and, and it was so much fun. I mean, you know, so I just think there's that aspect of just seeing a movie and having everyone react, you know, jointly is, is a whole nother experience. Yeah, there's a pulse in the room. Yes. Oh, I miss it. Yeah. Okay, I wanna move into a quick fire round of questions. This is fun. And if you can't think of an answer, it's fine, we'll skip it. Cause okay. I think it's unfair that I know what my answer is. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but we'll switch off. So I'll start with, Ka with Kathy and okay. So Kathy, you're stuck on an island and your sole form of, form of entertainment is you know a TV with a DVD or VHS. What movie do you take with you? Wow, okay. I'm gonna just say Magnolia. I don't know why that popped into my head, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Okay. Depressing. I love it. <laughs> Patty. What oh, you the same question. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah. You'll both have to do both questions. So you had the advantage here. You had a little, oh, I didn't know that I would have been like, <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, I might not even take something narrative if I was stuck on a island. Maybe it would be like a Brian Eno or something. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> I I think I would take like Castaway or something. Yeah. <laughs> really stay on brand. <laughs> um, all right, Patty, what's your favorite movie watching snack? Popcorn. I'm sorry. Boring, boring, boring. Yeah. You put anything in the popcorn or just popcorn? Just popcorn. I can eat a lot of it. A lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy? Same. Just yeah. popcorn, plain old popcorn. Nothing yeah. can be better. I'm going to have to agree with you Boring. Guys. Boring, but. It's not, though. I like it. <laughs> I mean, especially like fresh popcorn at the theater and like then you add even more butter and it's just, it's fantastic. Um, okay, Kathy, what was the last movie you saw in theaters? Ooh. Wow. Do I even remember? You'll see, that's so sad. Oh my goodness, I cannot remember. I mean, I see, I normally, I see a lot of movies yeah. in the theater. I go, you know, sometimes a couple times a week, but I'm completely drawing a blank. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Patty? That is such an interesting question because I am coming up totally, totally. I have to like look up, you know, what movies were in the theater in, you know. Yeah, it was right, it was right around Oscar season. So yeah, maybe February, yeah, it could have been. Yeah. I oh, mean. Sad, all right, well, hopefully that changes yeah. soon. Yeah. Wow, um, that's really scary. Yeah, yeah, that's scary, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the last one you saw? Uh, yes, only because I've asked this question to multiple uh -huh. people and I had to like, I, I had time to dig deep, but it was The Gentleman, which I actually enjoyed. Yeah. Was yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Patty, is there a film you rented the most? Um, I know some of our top renters, but I, I can't remember the number one. Um, maybe Kathy does. I know like... E2 Mama Tambien was up there. Um, like Bowling for Columbine was up there, believe it or not. Um, I'm trying to think of some, uh, I think like uh, Croupier was up there, some weird ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Kathy, this one's a little weird, but what is the worst movie to watch on a first date? <laughs> oh <laughs> that's hard i'm passing on that one <laughs> howdy do you have one well either something really like nauseating like a polanski's the tenant or else or repulsion or something like that or maybe um a bad something about relationships like mm -hmm. a Jaglom or a Alan Rudolph film or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was <laughs> those are genres to steer clear from. Yeah. Um okay Kathy, back to you. An iconic movie you're embarrassed to say you haven't seen. Um probably a western. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't like those spaghetti westerns. Yeah, there's I like I lo there's some really big like High Noon. I don't know if I've ever seen High Noon. <laughs> that's a kind of major movie. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. I haven't seen it either. Patty, yeah. um, I would say, you know, some of the silence. Like maybe I've seen parts of Birth of a Nation and things like that, but not you know some of those classic early films that mm -hmm. I probably, you know. Alina Wertmiller or something. I probably haven't seen, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, I feel like when I was in high school, we had to watch most of those in our film classes. And I unfortunately spent the whole time playing Fruit Ninja on my phone. So <laughs> <laughs> they were on the screen, but I don't think I've watched them. Um, okay, 
Patty, you're a huge book reader. Um, I would love to know if there's a book you've read that you want to see adapted and adapted well, if it was adapted well. <laughs> adapted well. Um, uh, there's a nonfiction book that, um, about the inequities in our health system, but that are kind of told from uh, the point of view of a Cambodian family. Um, and I just, it really, I don't know, this movie, this book really, The Spirit Catches Me When I Fall Down, I think it's called. Okay, wow. Yeah, that sounds really good. Uh, it's really, it's really good, yeah. Good well, book. actually, P Kathy, I'm gonna throw that to you in a minute. But Patty, real quick, I know you're a fan of documentaries. Uh -huh. So is there one you've seen recently that you'd recommend? Oh, I've seen so many lately. Um, trying to think of one that I really, really liked. Um, I'm drawing blank. You'll have to come back to me on that. Okay, so Kathy, the book question to you. Um, I'm just thinking of the books that I recently read and um, I recently read the Midnight Library. Which oh I yeah, I read that. Yeah, I do think it could be a well. cool movie. It, yeah. could be, it could be if they did it well, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, was, that was a fun one. Like with magical realism. Yeah. yeah. I like that answer. All right. Any documentary? Well, you know, actually what documentary I saw? Oh crap. What was it called? I think it was called Last Breath. And it's about a diver who got stuck. Um, he was, he's an oil rig, rig worker. He was stuck in the North Sea for over half an hour with only five minutes of oxygen. And wow. they, uh, it was a rescue mission to get him. Wow. Really well done. That sounds wow, good. that sounds really good. Sounds good. Yeah, it's on Netflix, highly recommend. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Um, anything come? Pat? No. <laughs> well, I was thinking about another book, actually, Disoriental. Oh, please, please. Disoriental, another one I think would be a great. It's a, it's sort of a, a Persian family saga, but um, really good. What was it called? Uh, Disoriental. Disoriental. Okay. Well, there's this other book, um, A Place for Us, which is also it's about a, a an Indian family, Indian American family. Mm -hmm. It's a family saga. Highly recommend. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm Patty and I could literally, <laughs> we could talk about books all day and we have, <laughs> but um, I, before we hop off, I would love for you guys to touch on the way that our listeners can support Vidiots and your fundraising efforts. Um, Kathy, could you answer? Okay. So, um, you know, we have a very ambitious $2.5 million fundraising goal, we've raised over a million, so we're doing really well. Um, we're hoping to start construction uh, in June next month and open first quarter next year. And so um, we are looking for founding members and that's like a $5,000 donation. We're suggesting you can go in with friends and you know get a group of you and or, you know, of course, we'll take any, any donation is nothing is too small. Mm -hmm. So um, go to the idiotsfoundation.org and do what you can. Yeah, we'll, we'll be putting a link to your foundation. Okay, that's great. Notes, that's great. And uh, you guys should all know Idiots is a nonprofit and donations are all tax deductible as allowed by law. We're actually, we're also gonna include in the show notes, the virtual tour of the Eagle Theater. That is awesome. It has renderings of what the space will look like upon completion and I just, yeah, it's exciting. Um, do you guys have any other insights you wanna share before we, before we leave? No, this has been really fun. Thank you, Maria. Um, and yeah, just say if you want a film space like this, just, you know, donate, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, seriously. Thank you. Thank you both for taking Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was really fun. It's been a great lesson. It's been, <laughs> you guys are great. <laughs> um, before we log off, I want to give a quick shout out as always to the rest of the Film Roundtable team, Aaron Weil, Doug Torres, Matthew Wolf, and our assistant, my wonderful sister, Jimena Prieto. And thanks everyone for your support on this platform. Follow us on Instagram at Film Roundtable to keep 
updates on our upcoming upcoming roundtables. Subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube, and then you'll never miss an episode. We will see you all soon. Thank you. Bye, Maria.